Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's Mark Bradley here at LMN. Um, we're going to talk about how and why to invest in equipment today. So um, what we're really going to kind of focus on is why equipment is often looked at as an expense rather than an opportunity to make uh, profit. So as we go through this, I'm just going to kind of really talk about the advantages of being a well-equipped company, and um, we're going to dive into the actual costs and really sort of hone in on what is affordable and what isn't for a landscape uh, business. So I think um, from all the years teaching workshops, a few things that I noticed, um, a lot of contractors just aren't confident if they're charging for their equipment. Um, and if you've been an LMN user for a while, you're probably pretty confident in this because you build a budget, you build your equipment into that budget, you get accurate markups, and of course, that translates through estimating. But often when people are using industry standard pricing and they're just simply saying, um, you know, so much per square foot, or they're using multipliers on uh, plant material costs and things like that, some old school uh, estimating methods, often equipment was sort of misunderstood and, and really not bid into the job directly or often it was even calculated into every job as overhead um, so definitely some some fuzzy area uh, around whether or not equipment is being recovered um, i don't think most have a plan to replace their equipment and that's a big problem um, as we run our businesses uh, we wear our equipment out so we can't, uh, we can't just simply get it paid for and think everything will be great in business once we get to that point. Because often, once it's paid for, it's getting to be worn out and it's re requiring more repairs. Or, you know, even if you do get a few good um, inexpensive years, we don't want to give our equipment away because inevitably it's going to wear out. Um, so there's, you know, three major ways to acquire equipment. We can buy our equipment outright with our own cash, uh, or we can borrow money from the bank and, and buy it outright. Um, and in which case we still need to pay the bank back for the, for the loan. We can lease our equipment um, and, or we can rent the equipment. And, and I think, you know, there's a strong argument to do all three. Sometimes, um, I think we want to oversimplify our businesses. And sometimes I think people say things like, well, how do you buy your equipment? Do you own or lease? How do you do it? And, and I've always kind of said, well, I, I really think it's smart to, to do all three um, in different scenarios. So we're going to talk about that. Um, so the problem sometimes when you own your equipment, in other words, you take the cash out of the bank if you've got it and you pay for your equipment outright. This is kind of a, an old school way of, of running a company, which is great if you can afford to. But the fact is many business owners have starved themselves on cash, even to the point where they don't pay themselves properly, just to say that they own all of their equipment outright. And Personally, I don't think that's a great way to run a business because although the business may seem um, easier to run, not having payments, it also kind of causes some laziness with pricing and some other things in your business. So what I mean by that is if there's no payments, sometimes you don't really have much concern about making um, profit off of each piece of equipment. It starts to appear as though the equipment's free. It doesn't turn up as a cost in accounting because there is no cost annually, but in fact, there is depreciation. And sometimes, you know, we look at our financial statements or our tax prepared financial statements that our, that our tax um, accounting firm may do for us each year um, to submit taxes. And, and we say, well, hey, I don't have to pay a lot of tax this year because of this depreciation offset it depreciation is real. Um, sometimes we start to think it's not. But the reality is, is that depreciation number is the amount that our equipment and other assets are depreciating annually. And so it's really not free, um, this equipment when it's paid for. And eventually, 
it gets old and we have to replace it. So sometimes people say, well, um, what, how should I go about buying equipment? And we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper um, once I get into some calculators here in a bit. But one common mistake I think I've seen a lot of people make in the, the business is leasing or buying equipment when they probably should have just rented equipment um, or vice versa. People who are renting all the time when they should probably just um, get a lease. Um, the key, the, the key d decision maker in that regard would always be, am I going to rent equipment for uh, 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 seasonally or am I going to lease it year round? And I think the business case there is always how much use you actually have for that piece of equipment. In other words, if it's a loader for doing snow and you're a um, landscape maintenance company in the summer, you probably don't need loaders. They don't cut grass and we just simply don't have enough work for a fleet of loaders. We may need one at the yard, but we don't need 12. Um, in that case, I think it makes sense to rent that equipment during the winter for snow and keep nice, fresh, new equipment each year so that we don't have a problem uh, with repairs because again, that's just a needless cost. And ultimately it keeps the cost down to the point where it's a lot more affordable to have that equipment. And then we're just simply trying to make profit off of renting equipment and, and using it on our job site, as opposed to trying to build um, long-term savings in a piece of equipment that's just simply depreciating year over year over year. We're better to take the profit and invest it elsewhere where we can actually get appreciation year to year um, versus investing in something that's depreciating. So for that reason, I think seasonal use always rent and seasonal use is sort of up to five months. So even when you're trying to expand your landscape business, your install business, if you're not confident that you have enough work but you know you need an extra crew uh, to, to keep up with peak demands or a project that you may have booked that, that's going to allow you to scale up a bit. In that situation, it's still better to rent the equipment that's needed for the crew. You can rent a truck, you can rent skid steer, excavator, whatever you need um, for the term. And that might be four or five months. And it may seem like waste, but it's certainly a lot safer than getting into really um, demanding long-term leases if you're not certain that you need that equipment later. I've seen a lot of um, businesses add uh, equipment for extra crews, but then struggle to keep it busy. And on a year like this one, um, where things are a little up in the air as far as when we're gonna go to work and, and how the economy is gonna shake out, I think renting is a safe way to scale up. Now, leasing. Uh, there's huge benefits to leasing as well. We would obviously want to lease if we know that we're going to keep that equipment busy for a certain term. In other words, if I book a year round maintenance contract and it involves uh, summer and winter maintenance, and I know that I need two trucks to service that contract and it's a three year contract, it's kind of a no brainer to go and lease two trucks because I've got the offset on that contract, I bid them into the contract. So I'll just lease those trucks for that three-year term with complete confidence that it makes sense because I need the trucks year round. So there's these cases for both. And, and I think it's important to kind of be aware of what the difference is and, and kind of use these as um, your methods of equipping the company most efficiently. Um, now, when it comes to install work, I often hear people kind of uh, saying that they, they kind of do things um, according to the equipment that they have. And I understand the mentality. It's, I've always kind of compared us landscapers to farmers. Um, I grew up in a, in a rural community and, uh, you know, if I was ever looking for some extra work uh, it was always easy to to find work with uh on on the various farms and um one thing that i always noticed with farmers is they 
always just kind of make do with what they have and they kind of like to work with their own tools and they don't like to ask to borrow things and don't even really like renting. They just kind of like to own everything they use. Um, And the problem I think with that, with us as business owners, we have employees and the cost of labor often creates um, a big inefficiency in terms of the, the overall job cost when we work with equipment that's not ideal for the job. Um, it's probably better to go and rent or subcontract or maybe just invest in the right equipment and lease or buy it if it's something that we need regularly. So I'm just gonna use this example um, for today of just a, a small excavation. Um, I'm gonna kind of talk about a tight access backyard excavation and lots of companies have skid steers or maybe they have a a small uh, dingo or you know that that type of a a digger the reality is we all have something and it's never always the right piece of equipment Um, you know it works 80 percent of the time for the type we of work we do but there's probably that other sort of 20 percent And, you know, on a small tight access backyard excavation, something that would take say 60 hours um, and two days to dig out by hand, often with with the dingo or, um, you know, similar small excavator type uh, track diggers, um, you know, you'd, you'd cut that time down significantly. But the reality is, is the buckets are small, and it takes a long time to go back and forth still to the to the truck and then loading becomes an issue often um so at the end of the day you save some time and it's certainly well worth owning because it doesn't take you know too many days to to cover a lease on a piece of equipment like that just in labor savings but sometimes there there might be a better way um personally over the years, we've we've done a lot of this type of work in my company, and what we found was using an excavator, a small, um, you know, one and a half to two ton excavator, with a with a power wheelbarrow, um, allowed us to move a lot more dirt than when we tried using the small track diggers. And the reason for that is. You know, if you use a a power wheelbarrow, there's many different brands out there. Um, I always use the Kubota KC70s. Um, They carried about uh, 1,200 pounds. So with the Mini X, you're you're loading that up pretty quick, and you can move dirt exceptionally fast because you're you're moving large volumes on each trip. So um, what I found was, you know, we could kind of cut the time in half generally of hand digging using the equipment and you know in some cases maybe faster but as a rule it was it was generally half the time so this is the result of of working with the right equipment and again even if you don't own it you can still rent it and still kind of reap this reward Um, but if you're using it often enough i would suggest uh, leasing or, or owning because that mini x and power wheelbarrow combination is incredibly um uh, efficient. So the expenses, let's just take a look at what happens when you have the right equipment for the job. So first off, the, co- the customer price is, is almost $3,000 when you hand dig because we have 60 man hours involved in the work. Now, when we get the, the dingo on site, we can cut the time down to say 45 man hours. We're still there a day and a half. Um, and I always say half days are tough because the reality is, is they, they turn into two days. Um, but the price here to the customer is twenty four twenty five, and our cost has dropped from 1400 to 1200 Now, interesting when you can get the job down to one day. What happens is that frees you up to be on another job the next day or uh, going, going further on this job if it's just sort of step one. Now, the estimated cost drops to 975. That's a big drop from 1400. And that's after factoring in the cost of the equipment and fuel. So the price to the customer is 1825. So 
kind of a big drop here, 2,950 down to 1825. So obviously there's a, it's going to be a lot easier to sell that job to a customer, but, and it's going to be a lot easier on the people doing the work. But the best part about it is my increased revenue per man hour. So when I produce $61 per hour instead of 49, at the end of the year, I produce a lot more revenue with each employee. So if you look at a 2000 hour year, which is a full-time year for any employee, that's a hundred thousand per employee doing it without a lot of equipment versus 122,000 with um, more equipment. And I like more volume because it reduces my overhead and it creates more profit. So we can just get more work done every day, which drives more revenue per employee. So ultimately the job gets done faster, which creates more opportunity for new sales. And that's where all this opportunity for more revenue per employee comes from at the end of the year. So the opportunity doing it by hand obviously is zero. We can't do it any faster. Doing it with the smaller equipment creates an efficiency which leads to about $675 in added opportunity. With the more equipment, that jumps exponentially up to 1350. And this is why well-equipped companies always drive a lot more revenue because when you have the equipment, more opportunities come your way because you can price your work more efficiently and you can be in more places um, in the same year. Our overhead drops by 50% when we're well equipped. Again, because we're pushing so much more volume each day, our overhead numbers drop exponentially. Some of the big advantages that are hard to calculate, obviously your customers are happier when things go faster. You generally do look more professional at the same time. Your employees are happier. Definitely people are happy when they're running a piece of the equipment as opposed to running a shovel and wheelbarrow. You get more referrals because as customers um, are having the work done and the neighbors are noticing, a well-equipped company that's super efficient always attracts more attention. It's almost like having the Discovery Channel happening on your own street when you see a really well-equipped, well-oiled machine performing the work in your neighborhood. It just leads to a lot more business. And ultimately, as a business owner, you're going to be happier because there's more profit there's a lot more work with less employees and you've got a competitive advantage on pricing. So um, we're gonna jump into the equipment budget here for a minute and we're just gonna talk about how to build a piece of equipment up in your budget to make some decisions related to buying, uh, leasing or renting. Um, so I'm just gonna open up my equipment budget here. And you can see this company budget um, right now, we've got a million, one, three, nine in sales. We're, we're looking for a 17.8% profit. And we're on the equipment budget, which is already at 15.4% as a ratio which this is our industry benchmarking, if anybody is on that is not familiar with that. The benchmarking is really designed to help you understand based on the type of work that you do, the mix of work, whether that be like commercial and residential maintenance versus design build or snow plowing. Um, we, the, the software blends the, your unique business and comes up with your ratios based on your work mix. So here it's saying that it, the, the ratio for this sample company is 15.4% and the industry average is 15%. So we're already at touch over, but that's fine since our profit down here is at 17.8%. So I'm gonna look at this and say, if I'm the owner and I'm thinking, I'd really like to have an extra crew truck this year, and I know that I need an extra skid steer and mini excavator to be more efficient because we're running two crews, we're split a lot of times, and we're trying to share the equipment, which is leading to a little bit of equipment renting 
And often we're just kind of trying to work efficiently um, and share back and forth and it just isn't working out. So I'm going to go to work on my budget here and, and, and make that change. So first off, I'm going to say, I know I've looked at a truck and I know that I want to get the F550 with a, with a, a hook lift system on it. And I've decided that I'm going to lease this unit. So I'm going to click lease and I can just simply get the lease payment from the leasing supplier and enter the lease payment here. Or if I haven't gotten a payment, I could always run, build one up, which I'll show you in a minute on it. <laughs> but for now, if I've gotten the price on this F550 with the hook lift system installed, and let's just say the, the payment has come out to $1,800 a month, I'm just gonna simply enter the $1,800 a month. I'm gonna use it year round. So it's going to cost twenty one thousand six hundred per year um, to have in the in the budget. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And now I'm going to just go back up and see my equipment ratios jumped. So obviously I'm starting to get a little higher, and I haven't even added some fuel yet for this truck, which is probably you know reasonably going to be an extra five thousand uh, to to fuel that truck for the year. So I'll add that probably not going to have a lot of repairs on a new truck, but my insurance is going to go up. Um, so I'll add that. So now my insurance, my ratio is getting up there. I'm at 18%. So the question is, as I start to add this equipment, am I going to add revenue? And so ultimately the way I've always kind of made this decision is if I'm planning a growth year, then I'm, I'm going to, build up my equipment in my budget and then I'm going to sort of decide how much revenue is needed in order to cover that. So I'm going to just keep going here. I'm going to go back to my crew trucks and say, I want to add a third crew truck. I already have crew trucks in here. This one's going to be the same. So I'm just simply going to change, change that to three. My mini excavator that I have right now is a little smaller than the one that I want. So I'm going to, I'm just going to build a new one. So I'm going to say I want to buy a CAT um, 305 excavator this time so that I have a bigger unit. And this time I'm going to say I'm going to borrow the money from the bank. So the machine cost is $120,000. And um, I'm going to say that I'm going to own the machine for 10 years and at the end of its life, the machine will be worth 40,000. And um, I can get a good deal on interest rate at 4%. So the annual cost of the business is 13,762. Um, now, if I'm gonna put the loan over five years, I can change that to five years and say, well, at five years, the machine will still be worth 70,000. And this might be a little more accurate way of calculating that payment. In other words, when you're putting a loan together, we wanna to look at how long we're gonna have the loan and what's gonna be owed at the end versus how long we're gonna keep the machine because what you'll find is it'll give you a little bit higher ROI. So. I've got that 305 in there now, and I know I want to add a skid steer. I'm just going to go ahead and add one because it's the same as the other one. So I'm going to increase that to two. And now I look and I say, well, my equipment ratio is really spiked up to 20.5%. And I'm not certain that I'm going to be able to get a lot more business. So what's going to happen to my profit? Well, right now I'm still at 12.8% profit, which is great. But the reality is if I've got this extra set of equipment, I will probably get more work done each day for the reasons shown in that previous example. We're just gonna get more work done as we go. So I'm just gonna go to my design build budget here and say, I know that if I've got two really well-equipped crews, I should be doing a lot more than 400,000 in, in revenue. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give each crew 
a goal of 300. I'm going to jump that goal up to 600,000. I'm going to go into my field labor and I'm going to say, now I'm going to have two install foremen and I'm still going to have the same number of laborers and have two lead hands and I'm not going to change anything else. So what's happened is my field labor has been updated. My equipment was updated, but I updated it based on what I'm going to need for this extra crew. And then I know my materials are going to definitely go up if I'm doing 600,000 in work. I'll probably spend about 150,000 in material because I know my ratios. And uh, basically, uh, my profit and loss now is at 14.4%. And my equipment ratio is still a touch on the high side, but I'm well equipped to grow even beyond where I'm at right now. So this is kind of how I would make the decision. I always base my decision based on the equipment ratio. I make my adjustments, adjustments to sales, field labor and materials. And then I really just kind of look at, hey, is, it, is the company still profitable? And I think this gives you the confidence to enter into sort of longer term um, finance arrangements, along with the actual contracts that you have in hand and the demands that you're seeing in the business. So if it's a short term contract, consider renting. If it's a longer term contract, consider leasing or buying. And I think having that sort of um, blend in your mindset really makes it a lot easier to make these decisions. Um, so I'm just going to jump back over to the presentation here. So back to um, uh, the conversation we were having, the equipment budget is really going to make the decision. It's going to make sure that I have a financial plan that makes sense. But when it comes to actually deciding what you need, I think it's important to work with your staff to try to look at where the most efficiencies are going to come from. Um, if you haven't used the LMN forms library yet, there's a, a really great section um, on waste elimination. And within that waste elimination section, um, it's, it's under lean production systems. You'll find there's a lot of tools and forms in there for doing training and um, implementing systems. And a lot of what you'll see there will help you um, kind of get some ideas from your from your crews and your foreman on what equipment would actually help drive efficiency in the business. And then, uh, again, run those numbers through your budget, see if it makes sense for your business to, to rent, lease, or buy, and then you can make that decision for yourself. Um, as always, uh, you can stay connected with um, us and uh, other LMN users at the Facebook LMN user group on LinkedIn. Um, we've also got a user group. It's a great way to, to chat with your peers, ask questions, get some input from other um, LMN users. And then we've got the LMN Academy online if you'd like to take some training or get, uh, get certified. Um, it's a great way for you and your employees to learn more. We've got the one-on-one -on -one support. We've got LMN workshops online now, um, completely virtual. And of course, you're on the webinar right now. Um, this was a big week for us um, this past week with, with the customer portal launching. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, there's lots of uh, great information in um, the online learning portal. And uh, we've got some demos up uh, as well for you to, to view. And feel free to reach out to uh, to your own customer service um, manager to help you um, get your setup anytime as well. But the the reason we built the portal was really to help landscapers bring their businesses sort of into the modern technology age, where customers really want to interact more virtually. They want to make payments, um, communicate, make requests, these types of things, all from a portal. So. It's really designed to uh, expedite your um, accounts receivable and sort of automate a lot of the uh, customer service um, 
requirements of, of you know of today's uh, consumers and commercial customers. So that was it for today. Um, appreciate everybody uh, checking in again, and and I'll be here again next week um, on Tuesday for another uh, another great webinar. Um, as part of today's package, you'll get an email with some equipment calculators and a few other uh, tools that you can put to work in your own business. And uh, again, thanks for um, checking in today.